In this series, Dominance and Duality, we've talked about how the left-sided ventral stream linguistic elements of our brain seem to overpower the right-sided dorsal stream relational aspects. We've talked about how our conscious experience is an emergent integration of these two conflicting modes of processing, what I have called perception and imagination. And in the last video, we talked about how one way that this integration shows up in the brain is as topographic or somatotopic representations of our subjective selves, like sensations of parts of our bodies, complex motor templates, and goal-oriented action plans. When these representational maps become active, subjective experience seems to emerge into our integrated consciousness, what I call vision, the universally accessible internal space that allows us to intentionally shape our existence, even at many levels that we are not directly aware of. As we discussed in part two of this series, Jordan Peterson calls this consciously integrated vision a map of meaning. He describes that the integration of the two sides of the brain results in a functional and dynamic conceptual structure that we call a narrative. In other words, conscious experience is a story. As he puts it, the uniquely specialized capacities of the right hemisphere appear to allow it to derive from repeated observations of behavior images of action patterns that the verbal left can arrange into stories. A story is a map of meaning a permanent but modifiable four-dimensional, spatial and temporal, representational model of the experiential field in its present and potential future manifestations. As we've discussed, it is an oversimplification to describe this process only in terms of the left and right brain, as Peterson does here. So to rephrase this quote more accurately, the dorsal stream is constantly producing visual imagery, constantly imagining, in order to map the seemingly infinite spatio-temporal relationships that exist in the world. Since we are embedded within the world, the dorsal stream is constantly mapping our own behavior into imagery as well. Over time, the dorsal stream will have imagined not just single instances of behavior like running or swimming, but a diverse repertoire of behavioral patterns complex goal-directed activities like brushing my teeth or taking the bus to the store. The dorsal stream can map these patterns into imagination and subsequently translate them into behavior, but it has no way of organizing them into an orderly linear structure. To the imaginative process of the dorsal stream and the right brain, these images of action patterns are like scattered pieces of a puzzle, a chaotic collection of connected scenes, the way you might experience a dream. And this is where the ventral stream comes into play. Thanks to its orderly linguistic style, it can symbolically describe these action patterns and arrange them like variables in an equation. For example, this morning I brushed my teeth, took the bus to the store, then went to work, and that was my day. In this way, the cooperative integration of the dorsal and ventral streams, or the left and right sides of the brain, creates a map of meaning, a mental space in which we represent the world and our relation to it. A collection of such stories constitutes a conscious identity, a persona or an ego with a pattern of past existence or memory, and conflicts that stand in the way of an ideal future, or motivations, hopes, and dreams. This narrative consciousness is imbued with asymmetries because, as I talked about in part one of this series, the dorsal and ventral streams and the left and right sides of our brains maintain separate and laterally imbalanced flows of information through the brain. But where this all gets really fascinating is that the imbalances in our brain emerge in an inverted or reflected form in our external reality. I mentioned in the second video of this series that most of our senses are processed by the brain on the opposite side that they are received. Our sensory and motor nerve fibers crisscross as they travel up and down the spinal cord. The left side of the brain largely projects to the right side of the body, and the right side of the brain largely projects to the left side of the body. Because of this, the externalized projection of dominance is reversed when compared to the dominance in our brains. Our orientation gets inverted at the interface between the mental and the physical. In other words, on the inside, the left brain dominates, but on the outside, the right body dominates. And this is quite obvious if you think about it. For example, 80% of people are right-handed. In addition, most people are right ear dominant, as they use their cell phones with their right ear, will naturally turn their right ear towards a person speaking in a loud place, and can more accurately remember information presented to their right ear. Most people also use their right eye to fix their gaze, and have more airflow through their right nostril than their left. 
This functional and physiological dominance seems to arise from asymmetries in genetic expression in the spinal cord during development. And this differential gene expression is known as epigenetic, a concept that we will explore in detail in future videos. There are many more examples of this right-sided dominance, but you get the point. What's more curious than these physical asymmetries is that this dominance seems to express itself in conceptual spaces as well, in the narratives that construct our conscious identities. We can see this in our language through the meanings of the word right, which in addition to referring to a direction in space, can also mean correct or just, as in righteousness. The word left, on the other hand, is literally translated into Latin as sinister, which means forbidding, evil, or criminal in English. This association between the right being good and the left being bad is directly related to some of the other functions of the left and right hemispheres. In neuroscientific terms, the left hemisphere became organized around a dopamine activation system, which made it superior for complex motor programming and speech. The right hemisphere became organized around a noradrenergic arousal system, which maintains alertness and orients the individual to new stimuli. This neural organization means that the left hemisphere and the ventral stream are directly associated with satisfaction, fulfillment, and goal completion. This is why dopamine is such a key player in the habitual nature of things like drug abuse. In Jordan Peterson's words again, the left hemisphere governs approach behavior in the presence of cues of satisfaction and is integrally involved in the production of positive affect. The left seems at its best when what is and what should be done are no longer questions. On the other hand, the right hemisphere and the dorsal stream are directly associated with incompletion, the unknown, and the unfamiliar. This neural dominance often imbalances our physical forms in the rightward direction. Some fascinating evidence for this can be found in a neurological disorder called hemispatial neglect, in which damage to one side of the brain causes a patient to completely ignore the opposite side of their body and visual field. The vast majority of hemispatial neglect cases cause people to ignore their left sides in favor of their right. For example, these neglect patients will only groom the right sides of their body and only eat food off of the right half of a plate. Right-sided neglect is possible, just as there are left-handed people, but right-sided neglect cases are much less likely to occur than left-sided neglect, even when it is the left side of the brain that sustained the damage. This is because the right side of the brain is significantly more connected to the body as a whole, which makes sense because the right side of the brain and the dorsal stream deal primarily with spatiotemporal relationships. We will explore these connections more deeply in the next video. But for now, we can say that in a very real way, dominance and duality molds not only our physical forms, but the entirety of our perceptual realities. Everything we experience, everything we know, is imbued with these spatial dominances. This inherent cognitive relationship between spatial directions and the emotional valence of concepts is known as orientational metaphor. And in the upcoming and final parts of this series, we will connect the neuroscientific and biological dominance and duality to the way that orientational metaphors shape our conscious existence as human beings. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for next time.